so hello, my name is uh, Stephen Haddad. I'm a scientific software engineer uh, at the Met Office in a team uh, called the Informatics Lab. Uh, so we're sort of the primary uh, data science team uh, at, the, at the Met Office, about uh, 25 of us now. Uh, and so I'm going to talk today about uh, ML ops for research software engineers, and we'll just describe that in more detail, but this kind of comes from my experience working in the infrastructure and data engineering team within the informatics lab of kind of trying to do uh, machine learning in a kind of robust, reproducible way. All the good things we, we try to encourage uh, researchers to do uh, generally as RSEs, uh, so figuring out what, what are the best ways to do that. Um, so the main outcomes, hopefully, from this uh, talk uh, can probably be summarized by, you've probably seen this XKCD. I realized when I was watching the previous talk that I'd failed to include any XKCD in my talk, so I quickly put this in. Uh, so you've seen this sort of impression about machine learning that you, you know, you've got a whole bunch of data, you throw it at an algorithm, some magic happens, uh, and then you get an answer out, but we don't really understand what's going on there. Uh, so hopefully the idea here is for us as RSEs to promote good practices, um, and in summary, uh, spoiler alert, they're mostly the same things you really do for non-machine learning projects uh, in supporting good coding practices, uh, fair data, and so on. Uh, there's some, perhaps some additional tools to make it easier uh, to do all that in a machine learning project. Um, so uh, some of the things that we kind of understand what additional tools and practices they are relating to ML ops. Uh, and how the kind of standard things we've just heard about in the previous two walkthroughs, for example, apply just as much to machine learning based projects as any other research projects, uh, as kind of software sustainability, uh, and then be able to use some of the tools I'll show you today uh, in your research projects uh, as soon as possible uh, to, to support a kind of good practice uh, for three, uh, in research projects. So the talk is titled uh, ML Ops for Research Software Engineers. So, I won't go into all the text, I seem to have written a lot here, but just to remind us what is an RSE, so someone who is developing uh, software for research. Um, and I mentioned some of the kind of key principles that I think are, is important for research software engineers, because that's what kind of will be the motivation for the kind of the tools that I'll be introducing. So for example, uh, hopefully reproducibility is something you aim for, being able to kind of rerun research and get the same answer. Uh, promote kind of good code quality and good code performance uh, as part of uh, research software and research pipelines that uh, kind of supports reproducibility. Uh, and also kind of work on uh, automation to kind of reduce the burden of uh, running uh, research software and infrastructure. Um, so kind of RS, the role of RSE is to make that, that whole process easier for, for researchers. Um, so I think in general, so the sort of key aspects of being an RSC for me is we're kind of providing that sort of technical foundation for research work, ensuring that research assets are, uh, use fair principles, which we've heard a lot about already, um, and then providing the technical underpinnings for doing all that. So that's what an RSC is. Hopefully you don't really need to explain much about it. But then just to mention what is MLOps. Uh, so this comes from uh, the term machine learning operations, which comes from the term DevOps, which is about good software development practices which in some ways aren't entirely relevant to the typical research software group because it comes from trying to address the problem of a kind of commercial teams where one team develops a product and another team supports it. Uh, and kind of you know, the, this phenomenon known as throwing it over the wall, you develop some software, but you don't really care about how it's going to work in operation. Whereas I think for most research teams, you're always the person who's both, both uh, developing the software and often supporting it as well. So that you kind of get around that uh, issue. But the idea is of ML ops, is, is still relevant, kind of having good software development practices throughout the life cycle to develop and support the software uh, to do its job. And MLOps basically just extends that into machine learning. Uh, so how can we have good software development practices that support uh, machine learning? Um, so here's a sort of diagram, kind of you go around this loop uh, in terms of development uh, is a typical um, uh, DevOps life cycle. And so for MLOps, Where's my diagram gone to? Ah, yeah. Uh, we have a similar sort of uh, diagram. 
around uh, a problem, so defining the problem, creating some prototypes, getting some data, preparing it, training models, evaluating models, and then in a sort of larger organization, so for example, this is developed by Uber, you then go into kind of productionizing and deploying models uh, and monitoring the, the outputs long term. Uh, so in this, in this presentation, I'm mainly going to be focusing on this loop because I think this is where most research software engineers spend a lot of their time uh, in, in developing research software. Uh, there may be some, some element of this, and I'm not going to really talk about that much, but it kind of uses the same tools as I'll be introducing in the notebooks. Um, so in general, from an RSE perspective, machine learning projects, I've divided into projects into, into three parts. So the data preparation and exploration part, where you're taking data from many sources and preparing it ready to use in a machine learning model. Uh, then model development, where you now are now taking that data and using it to, to train models. Um, and then model evaluation, uh, which then you are taking your trained models and assessing how well they perform. Uh, in general, looking into uh, explainable AI as well, trying to understand how machine learning models make their predictions and what they mean, uh, and generally trying to reuse and share those models as well. So uh, I will um, then, so we will be going into uh, sort of a notebook for each of those, looking at particular tools. Part of the reason for di uh, dividing it up like that is also because often they're uh, slightly different tools uh, for each of those sessions. And if you look at the, the repository, which I'll show in a moment, uh, the fact I've got different environments, just Conda environments now, but it could be a Docker environment or some other software development environment for each of those stages because they often have different tools and different kind of elements to the pipeline for each of those tasks. Uh, so it's a natural division from a RSE point of view, kind of the platform required for those sets of tasks. Uh, so without further ado, I will go into our first notebook. So to say all the notebooks are available uh, on uh, this, which I think is available in the abstract or somewhere, uh, on the Informatics Lab uh, website. So it's got uh, Conda environments to set up and run the notebooks uh, and links to uh, data. I've just all explained in the readme how to get the data from Zenodo uh, so you can run through this in your own time. Probably isn't enough time in 30 minutes to, uh, to do that at this point, but hopefully you can uh, go through it in your own time. Right, so let's move on to our first notebook. So the first part of uh, uh, the uh, sort of machine learning project is often data preparation and exploration. Um, which, uh, so in my experience, can often take a very long time, uh, but it's somewhere where um, RSEs can really add value uh, in being able to uh, create a sort of robust reproducible pipeline uh, to prepare the data uh, at scale. So a lot of the, the key principles uh, here in this section are kind of reusability of, of components in your data processing pipeline, uh, scalability, uh, so being able to uh, scale up the processing requirements of your data sets to match the problem, so rather than kind of limiting the sort of research inquiry to match the compute that you have, being able to scale up easily with appropriate tools, uh, and interactivity, be able to kind of interact with the data uh, to understand this content to inform your choices in building a machine learning model. Um, so here's a list of sort of sort of things you might do in this thing. You're kind of gathering data from lots of sources, cleaning it, removing bad data, uh, taking particular subsets that are of interest to you, calculating kind of derived fields, kind of classical feature engineering uh, to create things that will be useful predictors for your models, uh, merging data sets all together so you now have kind of a single coherent logical data set rather than lots of scattered data sources, uh, and then you want to kind of store it and catalog it. Uh, not unlike we saw in the previous talk, uh, and they also be able to kind of explore interactively the data to kind of understand it, because uh, kind of understanding your data is obviously the core of uh, a data-driven method like uh, machine learning. So what are RSCs going to be doing that's useful uh, in this part of the thing, How, you know, rather than something that any researcher could do? So I think the key tasks here are around setting up scalable infrastructure for running this sort of pipeline on very large data sets, which uh, often you know, machine learning models need very large data sets to, to train uh, to get a good result. So uh, you can't just easily run it sort of on a local machine or a laptop. It needs to scale up to running a cluster or uh, a large cloud environment. Uh, and that 
the, the technical knowledge required for that is somewhere where RSCs can add value. Uh, similarly, ensuring the data sets created with pipeline are reproducible, uh, much like we saw uh, that sort of pipeline approach uh, in the previous talk, so it's kind of building on that sort of idea. Uh, and ensuring that the particular components within it uh, can be reused uh, for different data sets and different projects um, to be uh, sort of more efficient development. Uh, and then ensure general good management of all the code as one would normally do uh, as an RSC promoting that. Uh, and hopefully also setting up infrastructure to share the data. So each data, uh, you know, often projects will work with quite similar data and as, as well as sharing code, hopefully data can be shared across a, a research group or a project team. So they're not kind of each doing their own thing separately, uh, but there's kind of synergy in uh, reusing data sets and potentially as you'll see kind of building up a catalog of data that can be kind of taken off the shelf and used uh, for machine learning projects. So we'll look at some key tools, how to do that in a moment. Uh, one of the areas is around kind of workflow management. So a tool to uh, set up a workflow and have it run at scale on a, a cluster of some sort. Uh, environment management uh, is, is often important for this. So in this case, we're running, I've been running this on a um, uh, Condor environment, uh, which I've, I've, I've set up using the requirements file here. And so this particular requirements file here. Uh, and I, I've set run a uh, Jupyter Lab server uh, for this, but that could of course be a Docker container or running somewhere else. This is just running on my local laptop now. But obviously, in a in a big a big uh, project, you'd want to run it on a larger environment. It's just for convenience. Uh, and then you want some visualization tools to kind of build an interactive dashboard, so you have to interact with the data. And then we look at some cataloging software called Intake to be able to kind of present the data in a way that people can easily find it and access it uh, for their own projects and, and reuse it. So in this case, for the for this purposes of this uh, walkthrough, I've chosen an example problem from uh, the Met Office, because uh, that's where I work, so uh, I'll use that example problem. So this is a, a problem around predicting uh, wind gusts, which are a problem for uh, uh, aviation in particular, where kind of, if you have a uh, an airport downwind uh, of this mountain range. You have these uh, turbulent wind gusts that form in the atmosphere and cause problems for planes, basically. And um, but these are very small scale features, so uh, often not picked up in uh, global weather models. Uh, or they don't give a sort of clear indication. So we want to have a machine learning model that's going to be. Uh, predicting the chance of a, the sort of wind gust event in a particular location uh, from global model weather model data. Uh, that's not particularly important for what I'll be showing you, but it's good context to see what's going on in the machine learning pipeline. Yes, I often feel as, a, as an RSE, I'm, I'm not, I don't ultimately uh, care much about the particular data that comes out, so long as my pipeline runs successfully. Uh, so in this case, what are we going to do? So we're going to load some data. This is the data from Zenodo, which is just uh, stored as a CSV file. Uh, it's not a particularly large data set. Uh, and oh, I should probably. Let's actually run it. Danger of live demo. Uh, so we're now going to load our data and we're going to use a, a workflow management tool called uh, Dask, uh, which basically enables you to, has a sort of lazy execution and loading paradigm. So you can load big data sets, set up a, uh, essentially an execution graph uh, of all your tasks, uh, and then it can send it to run off. Uh, you can set it up locally and point it at a cluster uh, locally or a Linux cluster in your research environment or on the cloud, uh, and it executes at scale. Uh, distributed over many processes to uh, efficiently load large data sets and, and process them. So this is not a particularly large data set, but it demonstrates uh, the, the principle. Uh, so we're now loading our data, but first we're going to set up a, a local cluster just running on my laptop um, using Dask. So it's just kind of specify I've got the four workers in my cluster. So obviously, if you were doing a bigger data set, you would be more uh, more set up here to point to the particular cluster and, and get it configured. Uh, but the, after that, the code should then be exactly the same. The Dask handles sending the data and code and stuff off to uh, the workers, which then process in parallel. Uh, 
so now it's, uh, it uses the same interface uh, to, as uh, pandas. So if you're familiar with pandas for reading um, uh, this sort of tabular data, uh, it uses the same thing. Um, but instead of uh, actually reading, it's just kind of read in the metadata and set up a, a sort of IOU which says, I will do this when you want, actually want the data, um, rather than having, so you don't have to wait for it to execute. Anyway, then we can do a whole bunch of other tasks. So we're going to get rid of any bad data, so negative wind speeds or neg um, negative temperatures. Negative temperatures because there's no such thing as negative Kelvin. Uh, so, uh, and uh, renaming some things, dropping duplicate data points, all the sorts of things you might typically do to clean up a data set to be ready for use. Um, as you can see, we haven't actually done any computation yet until we call uh, compute. So you can see if you look over here, we've got uh, a bunch of tasks now that are set up. So reading our data, getting items, uh, uh, and you've got these things called delayed objects, which is, it, which is how it represents this lazy execution paradigm uh, to do our tasks. And that doesn't happen then until I call compute when it actually uh, executes. In the meanwhile, we should be able to take a look uh, and monitor our um, computation using a, a Dask uh, dashboard, which is quite useful. Uh, you can see uh, we haven't actually got anything going on in our scheduler at the moment, um, but in theory now, if we uh, where's it gone to? call compute, uh, it should now actually do a task, but unfortunately it's quite quick, so it might not see it. Uh, so we've got so a task graph, which is really quite simple, uh, but that could be much more complicated, drawing to many different data sets and doing many operations at scale, uh, and hopefully would you know, you take longer if you were doing it uh, on a, a larger data set, but it should still uh, then be able to kind of scale out and use, so if you've got you know, dozens of processes, uh, can do a lot of that processing, you may have got many files that you're processing, you can do all that in parallel. Um, and so uh, process much faster. Uh, and also process much larger data sets potentially than you can easily load in memory because it kind of breaks it up into chunks and does it one at a time or in parallel, depending on what resources you have available. Uh, so that's fairly standard uh, and we can do other things to calculate uh, derived features. So for example, we had wind speed and direction, but we actually want, it's quite useful for machine learning purposes to have uh, north-south wind and east-west wind uh, as a predictor. That turns out to be more useful as a feature for our machine learning algorithm, so we calculate that. So now we've got a, a pre-processed data set, so um, this is something RSC could have done to kind of scale up this data set to use uh, a proper workflow management, uh, and then you want to save it out so you kind of have a cached version of it potentially, uh, so you don't have to redo the processing every time. So once you've got some dim data, you might want to explore it. Uh, so you can just do kind of do plots uh, in notebooks or in code, uh, however you like to, but it's also, also quite nice to enable researchers to interact without having to worry about uh, the coding behind it. And so there's lots of easy tools to kind of create nice dashboards for data now. Uh, I'm going to use something in the Holivers ecosystem, which is enables you to kind of create web dashboards kind of entirely in Python. Uh, in fact, you can do it entirely in a notebook if you want to. Uh, it's quite simple. Um, I'm just going to create a very simple one to plot some statistics about our data. Um, so just got some function which does some plotting and some little GUI widgets. Uh, you kind of put them together into a dashboard. Um, that's not the dashboard, but here's the dashboard, yeah. So here's a dashboard which shows some histogram of, of our, our, the air temperature in our data set. Uh, and so you can happily uh, compare it. So for example, uh, you might be interested in say wind direction. Uh, and maybe so that's the full data set, but you can compare say data where there was no, th these wind uh, events didn't happen uh, compared to where it did. Uh, you might see there's a difference in, in the distribution of, of wind speed and you've learned something about your data set. Uh, obviously, in a much larger data set, you could do this, have a more complicated dashboard. It makes it easier to interact with the data for, for researchers and people um, you know, don't have to think about the code behind it. So that's something RSCs can support. Let's skip over that example for now. Um, and then let's talk about uh, cataloging. So now that we've created our data set, you can uh, create a catalog of data to provide uh, a way for people to find what data is available. So you can imagine you can have a catalog that's not just for the, to one particular data set, but 
all the data sets uh, in your research group, for example, or in a particular area of interest, uh, which is just defined as a YAML file like this. So you can see I've created this in advance. It um, uh, just points to particular files, but it could be uh, more complicated than that. You could have a whole range of files. And the advantage of this is that also that uh, it kind of takes care of a lot of the pain of loading in large data sets with many, many files. Uh, that can be a bit of a pain to kind of wrangle all the data together. The catalog just kind of loads it through this intake software. Um, so for example, you, you open a catalog like I've got now, uh, and oh, excuse me, my order. As you can see, it's got some stuff in, so you can see what's in it. So we've got uh, the raw rotors data and the pre-processed data, and now I can just go read, uh, and there's my data now in memory, so I didn't have to go through all the process I've been through before to get the data. It kind of handles that, makes it easier for the researcher to access the data. Um, and that, that could, that you can uh, write your own uh, loading methods for your data to kind of abstract away as much of the the pain of getting the data. So it could be some much more complicated way of getting the data from some remote source or a database and just present it to the researcher uh, in memory ready to use for whatever their problem is. And that's obviously useful not just for machine learning but particularly uh, in a machine learning pipeline. So I think that's the, from an RSE point of view, that's uh, the key parts of um, data prep is kind of having a uh, a workflow management tool to execute at scale in a nice reproducible way, uh, some dashboarding tools to explore the data, uh, like Holivers, and something like Intake or some other cataloging software uh, to kind of make it easier to share, kind of apply the FAIR principles to the data sets you've created for machine learning. So that's part one. So I think this is um, uh, somewhere where ARCs can um, really add value. Uh, and this is also the part of, of a machine learning research problem that uses the most in terms of a kind of domain software uh, and supporting that uh, rather than kind of generic machine learning software. So in this case, I've used various kind of weather and climate data specific software to load it. Um, well, not, actually not that much in this example, but often the particular example of like weather and climate or genetics or astrophysics, a lot of the kind of uh, domain software will go in this part of the project and these environments. The next part of the project then is about training the model. And it's kind of once you prepare the data uh, using that domain specific knowledge, then you kind of move on to more uh, generic machine learning tools. Uh, so in this one, uh, going to look at training your model kind of reproducibly efficiently at scale. Uh, so the key principles again are kind of around that kind of reusability, so being able to reuse the training infrastructure and also the models themselves, uh, being able to run at scale. Uh, the uh, computational demands, as are well known, of training a machine learning model can be enormous um, uh, for, for large data sets and complicated models. Uh, so uh, being able to assist the researcher to actually run on exotic hardware, for example, GPUs, uh, or other platforms to uh, enable machine learning models to train in you know, less than years and years uh, is important and, and also be able to kind of have a pipeline that can be rerun and, and kind of tr produce the same uh, trained model. So what are the tasks in the model development where RSCs can add some value? Uh, so it kind of setting up again all that infrastructure around uh, training models. Uh, and facilitating running all the code on the different platforms, kind of porting can be a, a demanding technical task, which RSEs are probably a better place to do. And generally just supporting all the, the good development practices uh, in developing that, but particularly around something new is around uh, experiment tracking. Uh, so it's a bit like kind of the kind of fair data pipeline type idea, but particular to machine learning, to keep track of all the inputs and configs to uh, training a machine learning model together with the trained outputs kind of in one place, because you'll end up training multiple different models, especially in a research project, being able to compare the results, seeing what the best ones are, but also be able to know, okay, well, how did I get to this good result? You know, what were the uh, particular hyperparameters I used? What was a particular subset of data I used? Uh, all, all the things to be able to see how rep, kind of reproduce getting to that trained model uh, and the results. Uh, and then being able to kind of store the assets, uh, the machine learning model as a sort of asset in a fair way as another area that RSEs can get involved. Uh, so now we're gonna take our example problem of predicting wind rotors and, and actually train some models uh, using uh, a well-known machine learning framework called TensorFlow. 
Uh, so we'll import many, many libraries. Uh, and then we're going to use uh, a tool for experiment tracking called MLflow, uh, which you can't say, say keep track of all the, the elements uh, in a training and machine learning model. And we're also going to use another sort of dashboarding tool called TensorBoard to keep track of your model's training and its loss, hopefully improving and going down as you train, because um, that can take a long time. So we'll look at some sort of interactive tools to help you keep track of your training. Uh, so now we're going to load our data, and so making use of what we did in the previous thing, we're not going to go through the whole st all the steps of pre-processing the data, we're just going to load it now from our catalog, uh, which has our pre-processed data ready to use, so hopefully this kind of supports uh, uh, researchers not having to worry, uh, kind of separating out the concerns uh, between RSEs and researchers using machine learning models, they can just focus on now actually uh, training an appropriate uh, machine learning model and developing an architecture that's appropriate for the problem. Uh, so we're going to use the Rotus pre-process data, and there it is now in memory, all clean and hopefully wonderful and ready for use with machine learning. Uh, so one or two things just to see. So there's all our data, air temperature, humidity, wind speed and direction, but also the derived feature we calculated, the U-wind and V-wind, north-south wind and east-west wind. And there's a few things to do, there's always a few things um, to do to get it ready for machine learning further. Um, and then we're going to do some standard machine learning stuff. So in machine learning, typically you want to take your data set and split it up into train and test sets so that you'll have some data that your model's never seen before to test how well your model generalizes. That's called your test set. Uh, so we're splitting our, our data up like that. Uh, that's all kind of standard machine learning stuff, but the kind of focusing there on the ML up stuff uh, is this library called ML flow. Uh, so it's a sort of storage place um, and you can kind of set up a server. In this case, it's just running on my local machine, but this could be now running uh, on a server somewhere or on the cloud with a, a full uh, database for logging uh, metrics and stuff and a, a, an artifact store potentially on the cloud or some other place to store uh, all the artifacts associated with your machine learning model run, which can be the model itself, but often uh, many kind of plots of, of metrics and performance along the way. Um, so you have a kind of complete record of a particular machine learning experiment. Um, so you just sit, run it from the command line. So I've, I've run this command MLflow server pointed to a particular path where there'll be a local database and a, again a path on disk for an artifact store. And that's where all the stuff associated with my training is going to go. Um, so within that, you now um, set up a, an experiment, which is sort of one uh, kind of configuration of trying to train a machine learning model. Within that, you might do many runs, kind of representing kind of debugging towards what you intended for that experiment. Uh, but you might have multiple experiments where you say use different sorts of neural networks or uh, decision trees or uh, some other, maybe perhaps different uh, data sets to, to train. And those might all be different experiments. You can keep track of all that more easily through MLflow. So we've got that running. Uh, and then we can look at our, um, our dashboard for MLflow. So it provides a useful GUI to keep track of things. So for example, here I can see all the various uh, for this particular experiment that I'm doing, I've done a whole bunch of runs while I've been developing it, and it's got a whole bunch of artifacts saved there, um, which I'll show you in a moment once we've trained our model. So now we're going to set up our model. Try and set up our model. Uh, and um, it's now going to log all these things. We use a, there's a, an auto logging capability for common framework, so we don't have to explicitly log all these values whenever we fit our model, take all the input hyperparameters and log them uh, with uh, MLflow. And then we're going to set up TensorBoard so we can monitor our training run. And we've got another little GUI to monitor things. So now let's actually train our machine learning model. So now I can see uh, we're monitoring the, the training loss as it, as it goes along. Uh, so obviously this is not going to take particularly long because it's a small model, uh, but obviously in a much larger, more complicated one, you might want to see whether it's going right, maybe something's going wrong, you want to abort training, you spend all your very expensive GPU credits on something that's clearly got a bug in it. 
uh, uh, and so on. So this sort of tool can be very helpful uh, in help in researchers kind of monitoring uh, their infrastructure that they're using for machine learning model, and it's all something that uh, RSEs can really help set up. Uh, so while that's going, and then once you've uh, done that, so another example of then using um, a uh, workflow tool called Ray for hyperparameter tuning, which I won't go into today. But then to say that once you've done that, you want to save your model out. Um, there's lots of different ways to do that. You can save it using the native framework uh, format, but it's quite useful to use something like MLflow, uh, which saves it in a kind of model framework agnostic way so that you can easily use your downstream code uh, kind of from different models. So you could use PyTorch or TensorFlow or Scikit-Learn and have the same code for evaluating and using the results of your models. Uh, wrapped around this ML flow layer, which makes it kind of easier to have a nice kind of modular uh, code base uh, for your results. So while that's happening, I'll just show you ML flow quickly. So once you've done your, um, let's refresh. So you can see it's busy training there. Um, but if you look at a previous one, uh, it's now got a whole lot of uh, uh, metrics and, and parameters associated with it, uh, output metrics. It's got some uh, plots, hopefully. It doesn't have a plot, that's unfortunate. Uh, but it's also now actually saved our model as part of it uh, and an environment to be able to rerun our model. Uh, and so you can easily consume the models that you've trained uh, downstream. I'm running out of time. Um, so that's now model development. So uh, hopefully the RSCs have helped uh, uh, researchers train uh, at scale and, and save uh, models so they can be reused in a nice, easy to access way through this tool called MLflow uh, and monitored training through uh, TensorBoard. Uh, so still running. Yeah, the last part of then, this is then the model evaluation. So once you've got uh, your trained model, you've saved it out using MLflow or some other tool. Uh, you might want to then evaluate a whole bunch of models uh, to see how well they performed and then actually reuse the predictions from the models uh, for whatever research you're actually wanting to do. Um, so again, key, key kind of principles for RSCs getting involved, uh, reusability of uh, your machine learning models and components, being able to kind of produce predictions as well from your machine learning models at scale for uh, large problems, be, setting up all that infrastructure, and being able to kind of interactively explore uh, both the input data that we saw earlier, but also then the results uh, of your machine learning model and any kind of statistics and metrics around that. Uh, and so we use some of the same tools again to, that we've seen previously, now with the results of our machine learning model. Uh, so uh, we'll use uh, MLflow now to like, load in our model and our catalog of data to load in the, that, the data and then do some uh, what's called inference, so predictions which are with our machine learning model. Uh, and then we'll create a nice dashboard for our results so that researchers can see uh, all the results uh, together. Um, so let's run that. Uh, so first of all, we're now loading our data, as we've seen previously, the pre-processed data from our catalog, doing a bit of preparation, splitting to our train and test set, so we can evaluate how well we perform both on the data the model was trained with, uh, and also the unseen data in our, in our test set. Uh, so now we, we've done our pre-processing, we've got our train and test sets uh, for our model. Uh, so now we've got our, our pre-processed data. We also want to now load our trained model. So we're going to use uh, MLflow, which has helpfully stored our model, um, to, to load it up again for evaluation purposes. Uh, and so this is kind of separate because now, obviously, for evaluation, you're going to probably use a different set of tools for the evaluation to the uh, data preparation and the data, uh, model development. So again, there's another environment using different sorts of tools for uh, kind of dashboarding or explainable AI. Uh, so it's kind of another sort of logical next step uh, in a kind of RSE workflow supporting a machine learning project. So now from our MLflow, we might want to say, just get the latest uh, model that's been predicted. Um, uh, 
Uh, so now we've loaded uh, a Keras model uh, and we can do some prediction. And so it has now done some prediction of uh, probabilities of rotor events um, uh, from what we trained. It's not a particularly good model because we've trained it really quickly on a small data set, uh, but the pipeline from a kind of RSE point of view is exactly the same as if you were using a much larger data set or a more complicated machine learning architecture. Um, so we just, we just loaded the latest model. You can use MLflow then to interact with lots of different ways of getting models depending on what you're wanting to evaluate. Um, so you might want to get a, a particular model. Um, another useful thing I mentioned is you can get uh, a model and load it through the kind of generic MLflow function. So you, it could have been trained in any framework, uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch or some other framework of choice, and you can just kind of do these predictions through a kind of generic Python function to separate out your model evaluation code from how models were trained, kind of create it nice and modular, uh, kind of good software development principles. And, and you can also do it through the SCUI to find the most useful model that you're interested in. Is to, uh, so you might say, okay, that, that looks like an interesting model. The metrics were good for some reason. Uh, I'm now going to consume my model. And you kind of got this ID, which you can then load up into uh, your notebook and lo load it up and do some uh, predictions the same way. Uh, there, are, there are results which you can now use in downstream model evaluation. Uh, there's lots of other ways you can interact with the MLflow client to kind of get the best model. So, for example, you might want to um, search for model that gave, had the best metric within an experiment uh, and use that as your, your model that you're interested in to evaluate how well it performs. Uh, MLflow kind of enables you to kind of programmatically look through models in that way and kind of manage all the different experiments you've done. Uh, which quickly get out of hand with machine learning. There's lots of parameters and models that it's easy to lose track without uh, this sort of tool to help you. Uh, skip over that. So what might you want to do with your model that you've now loaded and you're ready to make some predictions? Well, obviously you might want to see how well it's done. So in this case, we've got a classification model. So we might want to calculate typical uh, classification-based metrics, uh, such as precision and recall, or some domain-specific metrics uh, relating to a particular field that you're interested in. We'll have some measure of perform uh, measuring what is a good model or a good prediction. Uh, so in this case, in the weather and climate, we're using something called the uh, symmetric external dependence index, which is used for kind of measuring extreme events like this. So you've got some kind of domain-specific code there, which you might want to use um, and typically make some plots. And um, so we can do some, some plots as per usual. Uh, and then kind of from an RIC point of view, what we can do is kind of create a pipeline to uh, display this not just sort of directly in code and through a notebook, but make it a bit easier. And again, use the Holovers ecosystem uh, for creating easy Python dashboards to then display similar metrics uh, easily, either in a notebook like this, or actually as a standalone web page, uh, which can be kind of presented for to share results uh, with people on the project or other stakeholders as well. Uh, and kind of interact with the data and, and the results. Uh, so for example, create some metric, some plot functions and some widgets. And, and here is our very simple dashboard. So we can see how we do on different metrics for uh, different uh, train and our test set and comparing it for different thresholds uh, for counting something as an event, uh, kind of interactively uh, interrogate our data. Uh, so yes, and there's lots of other things you could do. I've only got uh, no minutes left, so uh, I'll uh, uh, wrap up there just to mention something around explainable AI is another tool uh, that researchers will want to use increasingly. Um, that RSCs kind of help support running that at scale. Uh, they can be quite compute intensive, so RSCs can again add value by helping researchers kind of run that on scalable infrastructure and workflow tools. So in summary, uh, and some next steps, what you might want to do with this, so, um, you've hopefully I've seen this XKCD cartoon about good code. I'm not about to tell you how you can write good code. That's still a mystery, but hopefully I've given you some tools on how to 
uh, make it easier to have a good reproducible uh, workflow for machine learning projects. There's lots of things we haven't talked about, for example, uh, specifics of deploying onto particular platforms, such as cloud platforms, or integrating into a CI pipeline, or the specifics of testing these components. All the same good practices you use in other RSE projects in general apply to a machine learning project. Hopefully we're moving away from the idea of machine learning as being kind of something kind of new and exotic and therefore you don't apply the same rules to it, but actually uh, RSEs have a lot of value to add in making sure we have all that good, good uh, sort of robustness around projects applying to machine learning pipelines as well. Uh, sort of you know, version control, testing, documentation, applying fair principles and so on. So some next steps, uh, these tools are very easy to use. You can start using them on projects right away, such as catalogs, uh, uh, experiment tracking tools, data dashboarding. Uh, and there's lots of uh, material available from the, the sort of tools themselves, but also things such as there's an MLOps course now from Deep Learning AI on Coursera, if you want to find out more about how to use this as a RSE. Uh, and there's lots and lots of blog posts and tutorials to help you get started very quickly. So I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you very much for that. That was really interesting. Um, we've got some questions on Slido, so if you want to, um, yeah, go ahead and if you could read them out and yes, them and then we'll, uh, well the room. so it's the first step in MLOps to make sure all the code is in Python, not MATLAB or R. Uh, no, no, absolutely not. Uh, all those things I showed in general, there are equivalents in MATLAB and R, and uh, you can usually uh, use them interchangeably between those languages. So definitely not. Um, I just am most familiar with Python as the language I use, so that's kind of it's easier for me to show. Certainly R as a whole ecosystem with very nice tools around it, uh, thinking of like R Shiny for dashboards. Um, and so in general, you know, the tools themselves are not important, it's about the practices of having a way of kind of keeping track of experiments, easily sharing data through some sort of cataloging software. The kind of the principles are, I think, what's important. There's there's ways of doing that in all the different languages. So you know, certainly you can do follow kind of MLOps principles in any language, any platform, any framework. Um, so you don't have to be in Python, definitely not. Uh, what do you think are the skills that are at the intersection of RSC and MLOps? So that's that's very interesting. So hopefully um, you've gotten some of that out of the talk as we've gone along. Uh, but yeah, I think the the key things here are around kind of the infrastructure to do machine learning, there's lots of quite demanding infrastructure things to, to run machine learning models at scale that you know, researchers could easily spend a lot of their time uh, getting that all set up, um, time that they should be spending on other particular research tasks. And I think that's where RSCs are well versed to kind of be experts in doing that uh, and do it more easily and kind of supply that as a, as a service to uh, researchers. Um, so kind of all that, the kind of technical infrastructure stuff and generally promoting good practice. So as we do already, kind of promoting good coding practice uh, for research projects, applying whatever the good practices are appropriate for your project for machine learning as well. So I think the, those kind of uh, the key ways that are appropriate for applying uh, MLOps to research software engineering projects. Obviously there's other aspects of MLOps kind of focused on more like production, which will be less relevant. Uh, but yeah, I think kind of providing the infrastructure to researchers and promoting good practice in research projects, I think the kind of key interaction of those two things. Okay, brilliant. Um, thank you very much. We're out of time now, so if anyone uh, asks a question and it's unanswered, then I'm, I'm sure you'll be able to come and catch Stephen um, in the break afterwards. Uh, so can we give him another round of applause, please?